Welcome back. Well, reporting season can be brutal on fund managers who don't get it right, but of course uh, it can be fa fantastic times for celebration if their calls have been on the money. David Buckland is the CEO of Montgomery Investment Management and undoubtedly will be living on the edge until some of the key companies his fund has gone long on actually do their reporting. David, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Peter. Now, you know, you know I, can't all, I can't only ever think about you and Roger when I sent you, comes along and does a, a lousy report. Did, did that company surprise you with the, the latest on, you know, King Content? No, it didn't. Yeah. No, we, we, we wrote King Content down to nil yeah. um, months ago. Yeah. It, it was at one point seen as, a, as a, a great white hope for the company, wasn't it? Because they, they wouldn't have spent that money, I guess. Yeah, it spent about $40 million and it was seen as a yeah. um, as, as a nice add-on acquisition, but mm. it was pretty quickly decided by John Kroll and the board who, who articulated to the, uh, to the market that it looked like it wasn't what met the eye. Yeah. All right. So what, are the, the big, what has been the big problem with the company? Because no one would know that better than you, cause obviously because it was a company that you used to like. Yes. Yeah, so so what, what went wrong with it? Essentially, there's a, there's a competitor called Meltwater mm -hmm. who are gently uh, cutting their grass in, in, in layman's terms. They've mm -hmm. been uh, taking a little bit of market share from them and they've been dropping their prices mm -hmm. and they have not uh, Meltwater doesn't have to focus on the um, on the sort of old uh, media assets. They only focus on the online assets. Mm. So it means that their cost base is a lot lower than uh, than Icentia's. You can Icentia get even with them and make a comeback? Uh, they, are, they are gently getting even with them. They've picked mm. up about 50% of the uh, clients they've lost in the last six months, uh, which they lost in 2016. And I think they'll pick up quite a lot more in the in the, in the the six months to December. Hey, have you guys stuck solid with them and bought uh, look, more? We, we, we've Played it around, Peter. It got all the way down to about a dollar thirty or a dollar forty. Mm. We we bought a lot then. Mm. It then bounced all the way up to about two twenty, and we yeah. sold a lot then. So mm. we've been playing it around a little bit. Okay, but you, at this point in time, you're not completely convinced that it's a turnaround story. It, it's it's it's. We think it's a turnaround story, but we're not sure if it's structural or just cyclical. Okay, all right, mate. So let's just look at a couple of issues like valuations. I know. You know, you, you're, you think it's a very important issue when working out where the market's going to go and how you're going to invest. So you, I know you brought a chart along. So let's pull that chart up and tell us why you think this is relevant. Well, I, I think uh, we, we do get too locked into the sort of day-to-day -day, um, momentum of the market. Mm. And we forget about where the companies are actually being valued. And the first graph here is simply called the Tobin-Q ratio. And James T Tobin wrote a big paper in the late 1960s. And what he said there, Peter, was that um, what's the value of a, a company on, on a net net of debt basis versus a replacement value of those assets. Mm. And this um, graph that's uh, on everyone's screen, you know, goes back about 120 odd years. Mm. And what it actually says is that relative to that 120 years, the Tobin Q ratio has, has never been higher except for 1929 and, and roughly um, 2000 when we, just before we had the dot com sort of bomb. So there's three big peaks. Uh, the one on the left would be 29. The biggest one was 2000, right? Correct. And the one we're in now is, is obviously on the right hand side. side. And yeah. the long term average of this Tobin Cube ratio is about 0.69, mm -hmm. and it's now well over one. So we're just saying on a very long term basis, um, what, we, what we're simply saying is this does make the market look very expensive mm. and it's the third most expensive it's been in 120 years. The, the, the question I'd throw at you, David, would be uh, across most of that period where you look at that, the Tobin Q, interest rates would be more normal than they are today. They are unbelievably abnormal. Does that give a scope then for the, for that, the Tobin Q ratio to go a lot higher before the you-know-what hits the fan? Well, this, this is... The, this is an issue that we have with valuations is that most economies are, are receiving, you know, emergency low interest rates. So yeah. in Australia, they've never been below 1.5%. No. Uh, in Europe, you know, they've been approximately nil. They've never been lower in hundreds of years of, uh, of assessment. Mm. So this is the issue that we have to contend with is valuations are very high. Why are they high? That's not because earnings are strong or economies are no. strong. It's because interest rates are at an emergency low level. Where else do we put our money? Is what Where some else do people we put say? our money? So yeah. people get forced to chase assets, mm. not because they're necessarily great value, but because interest rates are so low. Yeah. So they feel trapped. OK. Let's go to the next chart.
So the next chart uh, is simply the market capitalisation of the US stock market versus the GDP ratio. Mm. And that's been going back effectively since World War II. And that, again, which is about 65-odd years, mm. that is an all-time high. So it's the market capitalisation versus the GDP of the economy. Now, mm. it seems to me that if some stocks do particularly well, such as, let's just, for example, say Amazon's doing particularly well, then all those companies that are doing, you know, that are, that are hurting should do quite badly. Mm. But when the market capitalisation of the entire market's doing extraordinarily well and is an all-time high, mm. it seems to me that, um, you know, caution is warranted. Yeah, so... so, so I guess the viewers are saying at the point that you're not coming here to say, buy stocks with your ears pinned back. We think there could be a few curveballs out there. Well, what we're saying is that you should require a bit of caution. You shouldn't just buy the market because interest rates are low. Mm -hmm. OK, let's go to the next one. So the next one is is simply called uh, the... the uh, Schiller CAPE or cyclically adjusted PEs mm. and what Schiller did in, in uh, his book exact, Irrational Exuberance mm. is he said look let's take the good times and the bad times out mm. of the cycle and let's look at the last 10 years of earnings to try and sort of take the rough with the smooth and then let's look at our PE based on the average of the last 10 years of earnings and again the highest this has ever been um, was around 2000 before the dot com bomb mm. when we when when the cape was around 40 yeah. and then prior to that it was 1929 when, when it was around 33 now today it's around 30 or 31 so it's the third highest level it's been in 135 years mm. since 1881 so again we just make the point that based on 10 year moving average earnings it's at the high end of the spectrum mm. you know based based on this information so again just another reason to sort of basically be a, a little bit cautious. Yeah, and, uh, but it's interesting. This is such a, a weird time we're living in, David. I think I read a headline today that Apple's share price went up, or its market cap went up, equivalent to one Ford Motor Company. <laughs> yeah, it's just, and, and like in one day, he after it reported the amount of market cap was equal to, I think, $45 billion, which equaled one Ford Motor Company. Yeah. So how, how do we relate this? Do you, do you think there's a fool's paradise going on when it comes to US tech companies? Well, all I know is that back in... Because you guys do invest in US oh, companies, yeah, we, don't you? Oh, yeah, we do, and some Chinese tech companies yeah. as well. But all I know is that back in 2000, there was a bunch of dot-com-type businesses... Mm. Um, that were going to be the next big thing. Mm. And a lot of them don't exist anymore or didn't make it. Mm. Um, all I know is that many of these businesses, business models seem to be a lot more sustainable. Mm. But the point I'm simply trying to make here, Peter, is that for every company that's going well, there's got to be various companies that are going quite badly because mm. the GDP of these economies is still only growing at 2 or 3%. Yeah, good point. They yeah. can't all be winners. OK, final shot. So the final chart is simply the Ford PE. Now, mm. I don't take this too seriously because... So this is, this is your, your, your comical end to the, to the interview, is it, David? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't take this too seriously because yeah. there are periods in deep recessions mm. where companies generally are earning nothing. Yeah. So take 1932. Yeah. You know, companies are earning nothing. You look at the Ford PE, it's, it's extremely low because forecast earnings are low. Mm. But still, companies were very, very, very cheap. Mm. But all this says is that if you take this information going back for... 25 or 30 years, mm. it just says that at, the, at, the, at 18 times it's much higher than the long term average of 15 times. Mm. So again, it's just sort of saying, look, a bit of caution is why. Yeah. I, I, I can recall even uh, before the GFC, I think um, the Ford P was only around 14 or so. But of course, there are other reasons why we had the GFC. Yeah, that's right. But but I think um, the point we've got to really got to make is that one of the reasons all these indicators are at the high end of the spectrum, whether it's over 65 years or 120 years or 135 years, is because interest rates are at emergency low levels and yeah. people are filling traps. So they're diving into all these assets, mm. not because they're necessarily great value, but because mm. they feel like they don't have a choice. OK, so... So, but does that mean that a company like yours, a fund like yours, that is actually a picker of stocks, is finding it hard because there are some silly valuations and therefore you, you just can't get maybe the companies you like at, 
at sensible prices? Yeah, well, as I've said a number of times on your show, Peter, um, you know, the Australian market hit close to 6,000 points April two years ago. Mm. So that's 28 months ago. It's still a couple of hundred points below that. Now, there's been a lot of sectoral movement within, within the market over the last two, two and a half years or thereabouts. Mm. But the point I'm simply trying to make is it's still hard to find genuine value. Mm. OK, mate. Well, um, given the fact that you, you, know, you do look for that, is there a company in recent times you've had a look at and you think... This is actually showing some promise. Yeah, I'd have to say we own a business called Speedcast, Peter. It's it's, it's currently about three and a half dollars. Um, it basically uh, allows uh, satellite internet uh, access mm. uh, to oil and gas companies, to cruise liners, uh, to governments in defence and the like. Um, it, its code is SDA, and we think it's worth closer to four and a half dollars. So that's and where Speedcast. is it now? Uh, it's about three and a half dollars at present. So okay. that'd be one of our, our preferred sort of me medium-sized businesses. It's capitalised at about eight hundred and thirty-four million dollars. And just for the sake of my viewers who actually care about these things, what, what does it actually do? I, 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 you, so what it does is it effectively has satellite. Uh, internet mm. and then it zeroes in on those cruise ships or that oil and gas platform or that defence type business mm. and it basically uh, gives them access as you, you would get at your so home. So it's in, like uh, really good bandwidth and really good efficient supply. Yeah. Of, of both uh, voice and data. Yeah. And how, how, what kind of market cap does it have, mate? Uh, $834 million, Peter. Oh, so it's a reasonably significant company. It is. It's actually made a couple of acquisitions uh, in the last uh, 12 months. Mm. Uh, one focused on government, one focused on the, uh, the oil and gas space. Mm. And uh, it's had a few capital raisings on the back of that to get its, its debt into sort of OK order. Mm. Not, not, not excellent order, but OK order. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think it's got some pretty good growth prospects ahead. OK. Well, one company you guys did like in the past, and you haven't mentioned it for a long time, I was wondering whether you revisited Green Cross. Um, you know, Pet Barn, look, to me, looks like a fantastic retail business. Um, have you ever, you know, reassessed it... Um, so we sold that a few years ago, yeah, no. and uh, it's it's one that's on the drawing board for us, but it just hasn't got to to, to the prices that we really like it yeah. at. So at this stage, you think it's overvalued? It, it, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't. Yes, yes, relative to our, our sort of quite strict requirements, yeah. we feel it's a bit overvalued. And and have there been any companies that you've actually liked, but the Amazon threat has made you think we just can't trust the the extrapolated earnings for a company like this when we don't know what kind of Amazon effect lies out there? Yeah, I, I think uh, something like JB Hi-Fi would be a great example yeah. where we think uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very finely run business. Um, it's, 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 it's got, had very good earnings growth, but we're just so petrified of the Amazon effect on a five-year view. And we know what can happen with some of these businesses. Um, they look very good for 12 months or 24 months or even 36 months. Yeah. But once Amazon gets moving, they can really crucify some of these companies. Yeah, you're certainly right. JB Hi-Fi is a great business. But, yeah, the big question marks there. David Buckland from uh, Montgomery Investment Management, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Peter. Coming up, we'll chat with uh, Matthew Miles, the CEO of MS Research, a charity that received the highest award on offer at the prestigious 2017 Telstra Business Awards for New South Wales.